Representation matters. But as indigenous Chicano people, we can't just sit back and wait for mainstream media outlets to make it happen for us. And nor should we. We started the Tales from Aztlantis podcast because we believe that it is imperative for Chicanos, Chicanas, and Chicanex people to produce our own media and tell our own stories. And the way we choose to do this is by using Buzzsprout to host the podcast. Buzzsprout is by far the easiest and best way to launch a professional podcast. You'll get a podcast website, audio players that you can drop into other websites, detailed analytics to see how people are listening, tools to promote your episodes, and much more. To start your own podcast and get a $20 Amazon gift card, follow the link in the show notes. This lets Buzzsprout know that we sent you and helps support the show. Buzzsprout, the easiest way to start a podcast. Now, on with the show. You must excuse me. I've grown quite where I... This hasn't been easy, I know. But you've learned a lesson. A lesson in honesty. Honesty to yourself and honesty to others. That lesson will stand you in good stead all your life. I, I think we've all learned a good lesson. I've always heard that honesty is the best policy. Now I'm catching on to why that's so, and 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 why that's so. Yali no chime, and welcome to Tales from Atlantis, the show where we explore Mesoamerican pseudo history, New Age nonsense, and other stories of adventure. We are your hosts, Curly Tlapoyawa and Ruben Arellano, also known as Tlacateca. Welcome, dear listeners, to yet another episode of Tales from Atlantis. Episode 18 of Eagles and Condors. But before we get started, I want to give a quick update and a shout out to everybody who worked together to get a mural fixed in Galveston, Texas. You see, dur uh, during Juneteenth, a mural celebrating African American history and heritage was placed on a building. It took up the entire side. It was a great mural, all except one thing. They included an Olmec head on the mural. Well, a group of us got together and approached the city of Galveston with our concerns. And as of last week, the Olmec head has been removed and will be replaced with a stunning Galveston sunrise. So... Congratulations to everybody on this victory against pseudo-history and anti-indigenous pseudoscience. The Eagles, Eagles and, Condor and Condor Prophecy. It's hard to believe that it's been almost 30 years since the quincentennial or the 500th anniversary of the so-called discovery of the New World by Christopher Columbus. Just as the Western world planned their celebrations leading up to 1992, indigenous activists from all over the Americas also gathered to plan their counter-colonialist demonstrations. While the world prepared to engage in the festivities celebrating what is basically the beginning of the American indigenous holocaust, native people mounted their own anti-Columbus counter-celebrations. But unlike previous intertribal events, this one brought indigenous people closer together under a pan-Indian coalition that condemned the celebration of an individual whom they deemed ultimately responsible for countless atrocities, crimes against humanity, and acts of genocide suffered by indigenous people at the hands of Europeans. As they continue to do so today, native people maintained that honoring Columbus was beyond problematic. It's just plain wrong. The reality of the insensitive celebrations became a catalyst for the burgeoning Indian movements during the years leading up to the quincentenary. By 1989, Native communities began rallying around the motto, 500 Years of Resistance, an empowering phrase that has stood the test of time. It is a cry still in usage today among people advocating for an anti-colonization and decolonization of Turtle Island, Abiala. Semanawak, or however you refer to the Americas. I hear people throw this phrase around a lot, 
so it's useful to know that its origins lie with the counter quincentennial activism of the late 1980s and early 90s. Prompted by the indifference from the world at large, these indigenous activists organized themselves into groups and formed coalitions across cultures and borders. A few of these organizations included the Confederation of Indian Nationalities of Ecuador or CONAIE, the National Indigenous Organization of Colombia or CONIC, and the South and Mesoamerican Indian Information Center, the SAIIC or SAIC. Together, they called on American indigenous nations to participate in the resistance and in the creation of a unified intercontinental movement. The activities of the coalition culminated in a 1990 anti-Columbus conference held in Quito, Ecuador. The conference, the first of its kind, was called the Intercontinental Indigenous Gathering, and from this event, a hemispheric pan-Indian solidarity developed, which sparked the 500 Years Movement, representing 500 years of resistance. Although international pan-Indianism has its roots in the civil rights era of the mid-20th century, the 90s saw a groundswell of indigenous activism. Arguably, the anti-Columbus quincentennial activities were the spark that lit the fuse. But it was the Zapatista uprising which brought global scrutiny to the plight of Native Americans. On January 1st, 1994, indigenous people from the Mexican state of Chiapas rose up to protect their lands and defend their autonomy against the neoliberal policies of the Mexican state and its collusion with the economic pressure of the United States and its North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, a trade agreement that has since been replaced by the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or the USMCA. This chapter in modern indigenous revolutionary resistance is well documented and considered to be the first social movement of the internet era. The World Wide Web was just coming online and being made available to the wider public, and the Zapatistas and their supporters used this new medium to their advantage. But that's a story for another time. Today we're going to take a closer look at the so-called quote-unquote prophecy of the eagle and the condor. A prophecy which supposedly foretold the eventual pan-Indian unity of the indigenous people of the Western Hemisphere. Whether you believe the prophecy or not, the fact remains that it helped spark various activities among indigenous activists who promoted the creation of a unified bloc against Eurocentrism, colonization, imperialism, predatory capitalism, and the further erosion of indigenous cultural patrimony. Perhaps one of the most popular manifestations of this has been the recurring peace and dignity journeys that happen every four years. This event got its start in 1992 during the counter quincentennial period. It's a community organized event that prides itself with not having any corporate sponsorship. The journeys begin at two points from the opposite ends of North and South America and meet somewhere in the middle, usually in Mexico. While these points might change from one event to the next, in the past, they have started from Alaska in the north and Tierra del Fuego in the south. Information on the journeys is ubiquitous. A simple Google search yields numerous websites promoting the prophecy. The following description from one of these sites describes its purpose and meaning thusly. The Peace and Dignity Journeys is a spiritual run formed by a coalition of various native nations from throughout the Americas. The significance of the journeys is not the runs themselves. The runs serve as a vehicle and medium for realizing the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. Elders from North, Central, and South America remember and talk about a prophecy that foretold how we will come together and reunite as one. We are like a body that was broken into pieces and this body will come back together to be whole again. The Peace and Dignity Journeys signify a coming together of different indigenous nations from throughout this continent to unite and reclaim the history and dignity of indigenous people. The history of the attack and attempted destruction of indigenous nations is well documented, but rarely do people have the opportunity to experience for themselves on a personal and intimate level how people have continued to maintain their culture and pass it on to future generations. The Peace and Dignity Journeys is the physical embodiment of the spiritual energy that will unite the eagle and the condor once again. 
That's powerful. Yeah. It's good stuff. The idea behind the journeys and the prophecy have motivated countless people over the last 30 years. We don't take issue with the journeys themselves, nor their overall purpose. However, we do question the source of the so-called prophecy, especially its supposed antiquity. Is it really an ancient prophecy dating to the early years of the European invasion of the Americas? And if so, what is the evidence in support of this claim? My research has revealed some interesting facts about the prophecy and the movement that inspired it, none of which provide any solid proof that the prophecy, as it's promoted today, existed before the anti-Columbus activism of the late 20th century. It is a product of that rich transnational indigenous coalition which has not yet been fully explored. To my knowledge, the only mention of this episode of modern pan-Indian history is in José Luis Malvado's master's thesis from San Francisco State University in 2012 entitled Peace and Dignity Journeys, Emergence of the Eagle and Condor. Malvido notes that a call to action was made by the participants as they hatched an action plan to protest the Columbus celebrations. There is an urgent need to organize an indigenous response to the celebration of the so-called discovery of America, now officially called by some governments the encounter of two worlds. Spain, the Vatican, United States, European, and Latin American governments are preparing many pompous events to celebrate the conquest of America. From our indigenous perspective, there was no encounter. The contact between the Europeans and Indians did not permit equal conditions and opportunities. On the contrary, it was an armed invasion motivated by the quest for resources and by the crisis of feudal European regimes. The most evident consequences of these violent acts were genocide, the rape of our women, torture, political and ideological and cultural submission, and death through diseases brought to the continent. Our land and our resources were plundered. Military and religious powers were the instruments of domination in the conquest. The conquest and the mentality of manifest destiny still prevails in modern society, in the operation of the oligarchy, in the abuses of the military, in the plundering of natural resources by the multinational and national companies. These activities affect a large portion of our society, and in particular, indigenous people. We are still witnessing colonial aggression. Thus, October 12, 1992, presents a great opportunity not to celebrate, nor to cry about our bad luck, but rather to reflect upon 500 years of the European invasion and to formulate alternatives for a better life in harmony with nature and human dignity. Our peoples are developing forms of political, religious, cultural, and economic interchange and interrelationship, a continental cultural identity, a civilization. Nevertheless, with the European invasion and subsequent process of colonization, we became isolated and out of communication, breaking a form of development we had attained. So, it is necessary to reestablish these lines of communication, to present an indigenous voice. Therefore, we invite all indigenous people of our continent to reflect on the real meaning of the conquest and to participate in the first continental meeting of indigenous peoples to be held at the end of June 1990. That message of resistance and empowerment was produced by the previously mentioned South and Mesoamerican Indian Information Center, or the Psych, in 1989. The Psych had its base of operations at the Intertribal Friendship House in Oakland, California, and had been issuing out bi-monthly newsletters on indigenous topics relating to Central and South America since 1983. In effect, what the Psych proposed was a call to action and a foundation from which to build a solid network of indigenous activism centered on countering genocide and bringing the plight of Indian people to the forefront of society, much like the activists that Alcatraz and Wooden Knee had done during the Red Power Movement days. During the planning of the counter quincentennial, the prophecy of the eagle and the condor had emerged. While the origins of the prophecy are shrouded in mystery, some researchers trace its basic elements to a 16th century messianic and shamanistic religious revival movement among Quechuas from the Peruvian Andean highlands that was called Taki Onkoy. 
I think I'm saying that right. The name of the movement Taki Onkoi loosely translates to sickness of the champ or dancing sickness. We'll get to that movement later. First, we must explore the context from which the so-called prophecy emerged. As with most prophecies, there are many versions and interpretations, but the one that concerns us here is the modern association of the eagle with the northern continent and the condor with the southern one. During the 1990 conference held in Quito, Ecuador, a group of Quechua representatives shared the prophecy of the eagle and the condor with the participants. John Curl, a journalist from Berkeley, California, attended the conference and described the instance when the non-Quechuan attendees learned of this prophecy. The gathering served as the place where many of the participants first heard of the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. In fact, the event's theme was the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. I asked some of the organizers what the meaning of the banner was that they were painting. They told me that it represented an old legend of the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. It's fair to say that the prophecy was relatively unknown outside of the Ecuadorian roots prior to its revelation. At the conference, representatives from other parts of the Americas also shared their prophecies, all of which forecasted the emergence of a new era of indigenous unity and enlightenment. This idea of a new era found a ready audience with people that blended indigenous spirituality with new age philosophy, which can be gleaned from the following quote from a North American Indian activist. We have been waiting 500 years. The Inca prophecies say that now, in this age, when the eagle of the north and the condor of the south fly together, the eagle will awaken. The eagles of the north cannot be free without the condors of the south. Now it's happening. Now is the time. The Aquarian Age is an era of light, an age of awakening, an age of returning to natural ways. Our generation is here to help begin this age, to prepare through different schools to understand the message of the heart, intuition, and nature. Native people speak with the earth. When consciousness awakens, we can fly high like the eagle or like the condor from Inca prophecy. This narrative is emblematic of most versions transmitted among indigenous activists since it was first shared in 1990. Notice the casual mention of the Aquarian Age and how out of place it seems in a prophecy that is originally attributed to Quechuans. It is telling that a concept associated with the counterculture and New Ageism found its way into native prophecy. It points to the unfortunate reality of how Western esotericism has crept into native traditions and become so deeply rooted that it now permeates through some revitalized indigenous traditions such as Mexicayot. For instance, I have encountered Mexicas over the years who admit to being theosophists, which is a new age spiritual tradition. Theosophy was founded by Helena Blavatsky in the late 19th century and it's basically a collection of mystical and occultist philosophies concerning direct knowledge of the presumed mysteries of life and nature, mainly that of the divine, existential origins, and the purpose of the universe. This is relevant here because the notion of the Age of Aquarius is one that is attributed as having originated from the theosophical tradition. The notion of a coming new age of Aquarius was then grafted onto indigenous prophecies. One such prophecy that comes to mind is the Aztec legend of the fifth sun, which states that the end of the current human era is imminent. This is supposed to signal the start of a new age, that of the sixth sun. Since the 70s, new agers have associated the sixth sun legend with the year 2012 and the completion of the Maya long count. The connection between the year 2012 and the Maya end times prophecies began during the 19th century but didn't gain prominence until the 70s when New Age authors such as Frank Waters, Jose Arguelles, and Terence McKenna popularized it. Two schools of thought emerged from this erroneous association. One was eschatological and the other transcendental. Followers of the eschatological school believe that the Maya had predicted the end of the world which would occur at the end of the long count on December 21st 2012. Those partial to the Transcendental School believed that humanity would enter a new age of harmony and higher consciousness. Needless to say, neither of the two predictions materialized on that long-awaited prophetic day. 
Anthony Avini, renowned archaeoastronomer, studied this cultural phenomenon and concluded that while the idea of quote unquote balancing the cosmos was prominent in ancient Maya literature, the 2012 phenomenon did not draw from those traditions. Instead, it was bound up with American concepts such as the New Age movement, millenarianism, and the belief in secret knowledge from distant times and places. Esoteric tenets such as these also came to influence modern Mexicayot and became a standard of the philosophy. This made it easier for modern Mexicas to imagine that there existed multiple traditions whose message coincided with those of their ancestors, the ancient Mexica people. As such, Mexicas incorporated the eagle and the condor prophecy into that of the sixth sun and thus suggested that the meeting of the North and the South American indigenous peoples initiated the coming of a new age. It isn't controversial to point out that over the years, Mexicas have incorporated spiritual practices and blended philosophical tenets of various cultures. So it's the easy hell to you see say. how... <laughs> 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 Ooh, yeah, exactly. So it's easy to see how New Age ideas found a home in the modern Mexicayo tradition. To be clear, I'm not suggesting that the Eagle and Condor prophecy is a New Age invention or tradition. I'm simply pointing out how these things get jumbled and confused over time. The point here is that there is no evidence to suggest that the current interpretation has anything to do with the original Taki Onkoi tradition that originated in the 16th century. That was a millenarian and nativist response by Andean peoples to the intrusion of Europeans on their land. Prior to the arrival of the colonizers, the eagle and condor dichotomy wasn't even a prophecy at all. It was just part of a local philosophical and spiritual interpretation. Anthropologist Jeff Jenkins, who's investigated the origin of the prophecy, explains it accordingly. What I glimpse into their understanding is that early in their history as a people, the ways of the condor and the ways of the eagle were shown to them. Initially, this understanding was irrespective of north-south dichotomies. Through the generations of emergence, powerful, personal, spiritual, and physical encounters clarified who the condor was and who the eagle was, as with any major plant, animal, or mineral ally. I understand that the condor archetype was symbiotic with the jungle harpy eagle archetype prior to European conquest. They soared together in both jungle and mountain terrain through the lands. The concepts of North and South and their respective archetypical, archetypal and geographical resonance became clearer through subsequent centuries. When the symbol of the bald eagle became the dominating force of USA orchestrated mass genocide of the indigenous peoples. Damn, that's harsh. I know it is. So while it may be nice to think that there is an ancient prophecy that heralded the pan-Indian coalition of the North and South American continents, like all prophecies, it appears to have been an after-the-fact application. Accepting this doesn't take away from the good things that have arisen from the Eagle Condor prophecy, such as the Peace and Dignity Journeys and the rise of pan-Indigenous activism. Arguably, the impact of this prophecy is even more powerful when placed in the historical context from which it emerged. And thus, our conclusion here is that the modern prophecy, while it is based on an older Andean philosophical tradition, it is not ancient, nor was it about a future pan-Indian unification or a coming new age. This observation does not detract from the good things that have come from it, and we fully support the ongoing anti-colonial decolonization and re-indigenization efforts by all Indian people. We do, however, want to reiterate that not everything that is done under the purview of indigeneity or Mexicayot necessitates a qualification from antiquity. It's perfectly all right to extract novel meanings from old ideas and to admit that they are new. As humans, we do it all the time in the name of progress. Tiawi Mexica! Orale! Yeah, I, I like the point you made there at the end that, you know, it doesn't have to be ancient. We don't have to ascribe antiquity to everything to somehow make it more legitimate. Exactly. In order to legitimize these ideas, we try to extend them into the past, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, regardless of when they were invented. Even if we know who and when it, they, you know, who invented them and, and when, we have this... Uh, 
reaction that, well, it's not really authentic or, you know, it's not as powerful or spiritual or whatever, Mm -hmm. unless it's ancient, unless we say that it came from this elder a long time ago. Right. I mean, I think it has has something to do with that, with the fact that without it, basing it on some ancient tradition that somehow it doesn't have the same resonance, that it doesn't have the same legitimacy. So that's part of it. But I also think that going back to discussions that we've had uh, privately and and at some points uh, during the podcast is this idea of, of acceptance by Northern Native people as well. Chicanos for a long time. Um, you know, we've had, uh, as a people, we've had coalitions, uh, going back to uh, what I just uh, described, the, the, pan, the rise of pan-Indigenous activism. This goes back to 50 years at least. Maybe even older than that, but at least since the late '60s to the to the early '70s, you know, during the uh, Red Power movements and the Chicano Power movement, you had a lot of collaboration and coalition building between Chicanos and 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 Native North Americans because you know we saw eye to eye in terms of our struggle in this nation and and Native uh, activists from the North uh, saw that Chicanos were connecting with their indigeneity, and so they accepted us as fellow indigenous peoples. And I think that at that time, some Chicanos, and I'm speculating now because I haven't done actual research on this, but I'm just sort of thinking out loud on this, uh, is that I think that perhaps to also, going back to this idea of legitimacy, to legitimize what we're doing is that we try to say, look, our, our things are also just as ancient as your traditions, even though perhaps mm-hmm. they might not be. Maybe they're a modern sort of invention that that is based on older ideas and that is sort of cobbled together to produce this new thing. But then we want to, after the fact, claim that it's some in- that's part of this ancient, unbroken line of... Uh, philosophies and cosmovision mm-hmm. and traditions when in fact it's it's relatively recent and like you were saying like like i said in the piece here it's like that's unnecessary we don't need to try to reinvent ourselves as having this unbroken tradition that dates back to antiquity we can be honest with ourselves and with those that we meet and say look we are uh, understand that as chicanos we're indigenous people and we're detribalized indians for the for the most part and over the past at least here in the u.s 50 years or so we've tried to reclaim our indigeneity and oftentimes we don't have all the the pieces of of that puzzle you know that we need to you know make this uh the the tradition you know come to life like the way our ancestors did it but we're trying to piece it together one piece at a time, and sometimes we're going to have to reinvent things, and and it's totally fine. Mm-hmm. I think a, a good example of that is Danza Azteca, right? I mean, exactly. So the tradition of Danza Azteca is maybe you know a couple of hundred years old, and but for whatever reason, you know, the danzantes, many in the Mexicayo will will claim like, no, this is an ancient, ancient, you know, pass it down through. A thousand years, you know, it goes back and it's like, well, one, dance is very ephemeral. So dance changes rapidly. So we don't even know the precise movements or rhythms, right? Because they weren't recorded. But that does not mean that Danza Azteca is not meaningful or powerful Mm -hmm. or a good way for people to connect and build community and re- connect with who they are as indigenous people you know it's a tradition a fairly modern tradition but that doesn't delegitimize it and another thing that makes me think of is we have all of these um you know the repatriation of of burials and Mm -hmm. you know indigenous nations are having to invent or create new ceremonies because this usually wasn't mm-hmm. something that was done traditionally, right? They, the bodies weren't exhumed and moved. But sometimes as an archaeologist, you know, you come across a human burial. So the first thing you do is you contact all of the local indigenous communities and they sort of hash it out over whose ancestors these were and what they want done with these remains. And when they take the remains back, there was no ceremony or ritual 
for this occasion. So they've had to create yeah. new ceremonies for the reburial of their ancestors. And this doesn't mean that these aren't legitimate ceremonies, right? They're, exactly. they're modern ceremonies and they serve a function, they serve a purpose, and they're meaningful to that community. So I think when we start, you know, claiming like, well, no, this thing is ancient and it, we just... It comes from that place of it, it only matters if it's ancient. Right. Well, you know, speaking of repatriation, um, I'm, I'm a member of uh, the Indigenous Cultures Institute. Um, I've been, which is run by the Meaca and Garza Coahuiltecan tribe of Texas uh, out of San Marcos, San Marcos, Texas. And uh, I've been part of that organization for a while now. I'm, I'm sort of like the... Uh, uh, the historian, right? I mean, that's that's my background. That's what I do. So I'm I'm the the historian of the organization, and uh, I've been, um, you know, able to participate in some of the repatriations that they've done because that's what I mean. Besides trying to revitalize the Kualatekan culture, uh, they also one of the main things that they do is uh, they try to repatriate as many remains that are found in Texas. Um, and, and so they've been successful and they have a track record going back over 30 years of, of repatriating remains. And they actually, a couple of years ago, were able to get the city of San Marcos to uh, donate a, a piece of land and, and some of the uh, nature preserve that they have out there towards the edge of town. And so they have their own cemetery out there. And, and uh, right before the pandemic hit, actually, um, they conducted their 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 uh, the most recent uh, repatriation ceremony, and, and I was there for that, and I was, I, I participated in, in, you know, the ceremony and uh, digging the, um, the grave. Uh, the women were the ones that that um, handled the remains and placed them in, in the burial. Um, I guess for lack for a lack of a better term, ground or chamber, and then uh, myself and a few others we covered. The remains and then so the whole time that i'm i'm doing this i'm thinking how going back to what you were saying about inventing a tradition how do indigenous people know what is the the proper procedure or protocol to be able to reinter remains that were originally interred by you know their ancestors uh in a certain way you know, you're, you're, I mean, I'm sure you're basing it on burial ceremonies, fun funerary ceremonies, but you're, you're still having to sort of invent new, new things to it because this is the second time that you're having to do it as a people. Yeah, the protocols. The protocols different. are, they have to be by necessity a little bit different. They have mm -hmm. to be adapted. So this is an example of adapting a tradition. And the Kualdekans don't claim that this is some an ancient tradition because it's not. You can't. You can't say that about repatriation. It's this is relatively recent within the last what maybe how old is NAGPRA? Nineteen ninety something, right? Ninety two, mm -hmm. early nineties. So this idea of repatriation is also a new concept, and I think we we probably need to do an entire episode on on repatriation since uh, absolutely you, you deal with that. And, and you know, so taking this back to the prophecy of the eagle and the condor, you know, I can see. How, you know, if you look at the condor as, as being a very South American type of bird and the eagle as being a very North American type of bird, <laughs> when you when you think about that, you know, it sort of makes sense to be like, yeah, and these represent the people and, and one day they're going to come together. Uh -huh. Even, you know, and it's based on this older prophecy that doesn't really have anything to do with peoples from the North and South coming together. Right. Right. But they took that, you take the name prophecy of the Eagle and the condor and you just sort of run with it. Right. Like, right. Oh, okay. So if, if the condor represents the South and the Eagle represents the North and the people, and it's a, it's a beautiful message. It is. I'm not going to deny that. And it caused right. a lot of great things to happen. But the problem is, is when we, again, when we attach antiquity to things that are very uh, modern and, it doesn't, you know, this isn't to belittle people who believe in this prophecy. It's just myself. I think it's more fascinating to know where the stuff actually comes from. To me, it I makes know. it more meaningful. Exactly. As a historian, I also like doing the research and finding the origins of where the, the modern iteration of the, the prophecy comes from. 
I'm like, why isn't there more on um, the actual pan-indigenous unification that was taking place in the activities of these anti-Columbus counter quincentennial activists? Where's that history? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, besides Malvidos, and there might be something else out there that I just wasn't aware of, but when I was doing this research, but I mean, he seems to be the only individual so far that's really looked into this. And I'm wondering, you know, instead of focusing on these so-called prophecies, why don't we look at what was going on when the, when it emerged and see where, you know, where it started, where it's been and see where it's going. I mean, you can make the connections between what was going on then with uh, a lot of the, the activism of the you know last four to five years with uh, the pipelines, for example. Mm -hmm. Like there's a connection there. I mean, I'm sure that you might be able to find maybe not the same actors, but you can find the same kind of influences or maybe, you know, by word of mouth, someone knew of someone that was part of the quincentennial celebration, someone's relative. And so you can start making those connections and start telling that story of mm -hmm. how that came to be. But going back to what you were saying about, you know, the eagle is from the north and the condor is from the south. And I'm thinking, hmm, don't we have condors in the Grand Canyon? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> what, I mean, don't they have eagles in South America? I mean, yes. there's a reason why they call it the eagle and the condor because they were aware of the eagle. Yeah, the jungle because eagle. both existed and you could they see them exist flying together. <laughs> everywhere. So this idea that the north is the eagle and the south is a condor seems to be a little too simplistic for me, you know? Well, yeah, like, absolutely. And then you have the, the book written by a friend of the show, uh, Domingo <laughs> Martinez Paredes. <laughs> Yeah, he would be a fan if he was around. Yeah, um, his book was called, uh, what was his book called? Una... Un, un Continente y Una Cultura. There you go. One Continent, One Culture, which, by the way, is such a stupid statement because just, one, it's two continents. You know, it's a single landmass, but it's uh, two oh, continents. You're, you're getting into trouble there, Curly. I know, with all this science and facts. Um but, but why, is, just, why, why is it why is it two continents? Well, because of the continental plates, it exists on two separate continental plates, uh -huh. and so basically, where Panama is, present day Panama, is mm -hmm. where these two continents collided, uh, and it closed it. that gap. So actually, the creation of Panama, the 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 colliding of the two continents, is what caused the Ice Age. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, this was like a global event that was caused by this. Um, so to just paint it as, well, it's one continent, just to make it work, right? With Because one continent, one, one culture, it's very catchy, but it doesn't fit with reality because it's two continents. And then to say one culture, that's very, I don't know, it's talk about essentializing diverse yeah, yeah. indigenous populations and just, yeah. no, you're all the same. Right. You're all the same. Yeah. You, you, you're all, you know, all of our cultures are the same. And that's why we need to work together. Instead of being like our culture, we represent diverse, complex cultures that mm -hmm. evolved over thousands of years in different environments. And we gave rise to these civilizations. I mean, that's power. That's beautiful. Right. And as indigenous people, we should come together. Like, it's this thing with the. The prophecy of the eagle and the condor, the modern interpretation of it, and you're talking about, you know, the, the pipeline and all the way, you know, to Alcatraz and Wounded Knee, I think it's much more powerful and beautiful to be like, we, the descendants, instead of ascribing it to antiquity, saying, no, we, the modern descendants of our ancestors as indigenous people are creating our own prophecy mm -hmm. that we are going to come together and we're making it happen. You know, we're, right. we're, we're creating this prophecy by causing it to happen. I think that's well, more powerful. To be fair to Paredes, I mean, do you think that maybe, uh, I mean, he used the word culture. I think that that's probably not, not the best choice of words. Maybe he meant like, Maybe the intention that he was trying to get at was that one indigenous people as a whole, like one race, like it used to be, like that was the, the scientific way mm -hmm. 
of understanding the the world back when he was around, when he was studying the stuff, you know, going back to the early 20th century. So he came from that old thought of like the different races of the world. You had the white and you had the black, you had the the Asian, and then you had the the Native American, which encompassed North and South. Mm -hmm. So maybe he was looking at it from that perspective, which I'll I'll give him that. I'll give him that. But what I won't give him, what I won't give him is that image that he used on the cover of his original (laughs) book where he tries to show or pretend. I don't know what his intention was. And I think I think that this is also back to the after the fact application of people in, in the modern day who have looked at his book and who have uh, learned about the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. And then they look at his book and they look at that image and they think, oh, see, look, it's on the page. Mm-hmm. It's an eagle and a condor, except... And their necks except, are intertwined and they're coming together. Right. The, the necks are intertwined, kind of like to symbolize the Nawiolin mm-hmm. movement, connection. And the fact is that he took this image from... And his book was published in 1960, I believe, 61. It was in the early 60s, right? But it was his book. Yes. And so I went back and, and, and I had to do some real digging because I couldn't find any information. And he doesn't provide. Usually um, authors provide or the publisher provide uh, a citation as to, you know, the image credit for, for the cover of, of the book. And whenever you don't see that, you should be very... Um, curious as to why they are providing that for you. What what are you hiding? What are they hiding? And in this case, Paredes took that image from it's actually a paper. It's in one of the Peabody uh, Museum of American Archaeology and Ethnology from out of Harvard. And the paper was called Animal Figures in the Maya Codices by Alfred M. Tosser and Glover M. Allen. And this was from 1910. And anyone that's interested, you can Google this and find it online. Volume four, number three. And if you go to page, uh, it's one of the play. It's one of the appendices, kind of towards the end of the book. I don't think it's numerated, but there it's plate 17, and it's titled "Aves," meaning birds in Spanish. And if you look at number four, it says king vulture and oscillated turkey and these are referring to the image that Paredes, is, Paredes used in his book Un Continente y Una Cultura to try to to try to convince people that he's talking about the eagle and the condor and, and I only bring this up because I was stumped for the longest time when I first originally published this piece on Mexica.org some years ago I had someone who read it whom I know personally who uh, spoke to me uh, in person, and they said, "Well, what about but this is book? If if the the tradition and the prophecy of the eagle and the condor doesn't go further than 1990, how do you explain his book and the image?" And I'm going to be honest, that person, that individual, stumped me for the longest time. But when I was preparing for this episode, I finally stumbled on the source, and. It's not even an eagle or a condor. Yeah, it's not an eagle or a Ever. condor. <laughs> <laughs> and if you if you don't know um, Maya symbols, right, you might look at this and think, oh, so that's an eagle and that's a condor. When in reality, uh, neither are, are, are those things. <laughs> But but what always bugged me about that about that challenge uh, because I, I took it as a challenge. Oh, I'm being challenged. I need to find out the source of this. Mm-hmm. And it always struck me that Paredes never mentions the prophecy in his book. Mm-hmm. So if the prophecy predated 1990 and this idea of the North and the South meeting with the eagle and the condor, you and he uses his image in his book, you would think he would have mentioned it in that book. Yeah, and he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't mention it at all. So that's another strike. <laughs> well, strike two. <laughs> so, well, getting ready for this show, I did a quick uh, search online on the interwebs and found a couple of different versions 
of the uh, eagle condor prophecy. And the one that really st- stood out to me was one from this guy, John Perkins. John Perkins is a new age author and he's the founder of something called the Pachamama Alliance. And he's sounds legit. Yeah. Right. Why wouldn't it be? <laughs> um, <clears throat> he's huge on the prophecy of the Eagle and the condor, but, his story about the prophecy is very interesting. So he claims, and this might even be true, that in the 1960s, he was an apprentice to a shaman in South America. You know, now that I say that out loud, it's probably not true. It's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> so he claims he was an apprentice to a, a shaman in the Amazon in the 1960s, and that in 1969, this shaman revealed to him this prophecy of the eagle and the condor. And according to John Perkins, the condor represents indigenous people, not just southern indigenous people, but all indigenous people as a whole, while the eagle represents the white man and the European. Wait, wait, say that again. I'm sorry. I missed it. The eagle represents who now? The the white man, the European. And the condor is all indigenous All indigenous people of, of the Americas. Of the Americas. Yeah. There's no distinction between north and south. No. That, that the condor represents okay. all indigenous people of the Americas and the eagle represents uh, the European. And right, we need to uh, alert Mexico. To, they need to change their flag to a <laughs> right? condor. <laughs> so... According to John Perkins, the prophecy is that, you know, one day the eagle and the condor will unite and move the world forward into a new state of consciousness, a new state into of harmony. A new, a new age, you would say? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I found this really interesting because it's taking this prophecy and totally turning it on its head and... You know, they're they're rewriting the prophecy again in, in such okay. a way that they've inserted Europeans into it. Yeah. So to give them like, oh, okay, so we're part of this prophecy too. Right. And so right. now it's gonna to, give them meaning. And of course To legitimize to legitimize the the, the fact that white people have inhabited most of North America and are, you know, they influence the politics and the economics that happen of South America. Mm-hmm. So, so it's it's kind of like a way. It's another after the fact prophecy, where you take current events and you uh, go backwards in time and you apply them to things that were supposedly foretold were going to yeah. happen. In the and uh, you know, if if you're a a white person who so wishes, you could participate in the uh, articulation of this prophecy by joining his Pachamama uh, organization, right? And so I started going through their literature and this, uh, this stuck out to me. He says, there has been and continues to be a desire on the part of the Eagle peoples to understand Condor peoples and an interest on the part of Condor peoples to share their knowledge. The shamans have come forward, now willing to offer their wisdom. They are also very interested in learning more about the eagle people and science. This mutual interest and education is a manifestation of the prophecy. Like, there's a lot to (laughs) unpack in there, man. Wow. So, like, it basically gives white people the green light, right, to culturally appropriate in, to yeah, yeah come on in and and claim come this is, is yours and, you're all welcome and participate in the ceremonies because you know there's an interest on part of the condor peoples to share their knowledge so of course we should take this knowledge and commodify it <laughs> and sell ceremonies you know Jeez. so this is one of the dangers of uh you know just not Believe questioning yeah of, of not questioning prophecies and the origins of where these things come from is it just leaves the door wide open 
to these new age beliefs. And in your piece, I'm really glad that you mentioned theosophy and yeah. the uh, the impact mm. that that's had on Mexicayo in particular, because you and right. I have both encountered tons of people. And when they get talking about traditional ancestral teachings, it sounds an awful lot like theosophy. Like, <laughs> you know, you... You, you go off on, on Ruben and I claiming that we're being Western by questioning things, but you're following a purely Euro Western tradition and painting it as if it were indigenous knowledge, you know? You, you know, like like the indigenous knowledge of Reiki and... Uh, yeah, and tarot cards and, and, you know... Acupuncture. Acupuncture. <laughs> Homeopathy. Homeopathy. <laughs> and it's like you know all those all those good Mexica traditions yeah, handed down by good, the ancestors that come from uh, ancient Mexica elders like Helena Blavatsky. <laughs> 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 so you know, next time you're uh, talking about Hel- Helenitsin Blav- <laughs> Blavatsky, <laughs> Blavatsky, whatever. It's oh. like. Uh, you know, next time you decide to talk about Western ideas, maybe check your own traditions and yeah. realize the the incursion of Western thought that has taken place in, in a lot of these things. But, you know, mm. these guys, they're, they're not interested in, uh, in the truth, man. I know, right? What is it about the truth again? Well, the truth is like medicine, homie. It doesn't always taste good. But it's always good for you. Orale. Timo Back in 1968, I was a Peace Corps volunteer deep in the Amazon rainforest. And the shamans told me the prophecy of the eagle and the condor. The prophecy says that back long, long ago, human societies would take two different courses. One would be the path of the eagle, which was said to be the path of the mind of intellect, of science and technology and industry. The other would be the path of the condor, the path of the heart, of intuition, of passion, of connection to the earth. And according to the prophecy, these two parts of human societies would go in very different directions for hundreds of years. And then in the late 1400s, they would come together and clash. And the eagle peoples would be so powerful, so strong, that they would practically drive the condor people into extinction, but not quite. And of course, we know that's what happened. Columbus, after that, the industrial nations of the world practically drove the indigenous nations into extinction, but not quite. The prophecy goes on to say that about 500 years later, at the end of the 1900s, the opportunity would arise for the eagle and the condor to soar together in one sky, to mate and to create human societies at a new level of consciousness. And so it was about that time in the early 1990s that the Achua made the call from the Amazon that Lynn referred to. They told me that the world is as you dream it and that the eagle cultures have had a dream that's become far too materialistic. They asked for help in saving their forests and their cultures. They asked us to help them get rid of this dysfunctional dream and the encroaching oil companies and the extremely dangerous situation that all of them were facing. But their call was not just about them. It was a global message. It was a message that they said came from the rainforest itself, from the heart of Pachamama. The future of the world, they said, depended on us coming together, eagles and condors. And condors. Thank you for listening to Tales from Atlantis, a project of the Chimali Institute of Mesoamerican Arts. 
If you enjoy the show, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter. You can do this by visiting talesfromastlantis.com and clicking support the podcast. Your continued support will help keep the podcast ad-free and independent. Until next time, Timo Itase.